We're going to begin the service this morning uh, with a responsive call to worship. I invite you to, to stand with me and we'll read it together. It is good to praise the Lord and make music to your name, O Most High. To the music of the ten-stringed lyre and the melody of the harp. You make us glad by your deeds, O Lord. We sing for joy at the works of your hands. How great are your works, O Lord! How profound your thoughts! The righteous will flourish like a palm tree. They will grow like the cedar of Lebanon. Planted in the house of the Lord, they will flourish in the courts of our God. They will still bear fruit in old age. They will stay fresh and green. Proclaiming the Lord is upright. The Lord is upright. He is our rock. He is our rock. There is no wickedness in him. It is good, good to, to praise, praise the Lord. Lord. How great, great are, are your works, O Lord. Lord. How, How profound are your thoughts. thoughts. Please remain standing as we worship the Lord in song.
and sores went away, and they were jumping up and down, and they were so happy. But you know what? Only one of the men came back and said thank you to Jesus. And today, we're all thinking about being thankful to God for all the good things that he gives us. And it's wonderful that we have Thanksgiving Sunday, but do we need to be thankful to God, not just on this one day, but every day. And so sometimes we're all like those other nine guys who forgot to say thank you. So let's try and remember to thank God every day for all the good things he gives us, not just on Thanksgiving Day. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for this day. We thank you so much for all the wonderful things that you have given us, for families, for food, for our country, and most of all, that you sent your son Jesus to save us. And so we thank you today, and we ask that you would help us to remember to be thankful every day for all the things that you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Good morning. Good morning. Happy Thanksgiving. I want to use the video to tell the Grace Father Church thank you for all the benefits and uh, the love and show for the Sweet family every day. This morning I'll be reading from the book of Psalm number one, three from verse, from verses one to five and uh, verses twenty one to twenty two. And it reads, Praise the Lord, O my soul, O my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul. And forget not all his benefits. He forgives all my sins and heals all my diseases. He redeems my life from the pit and crowns me with love and compassion. He satisfies my desires with good things so that my youth is renewed like the eagles. Praise the Lord, all his heavenly hosts, you his servants who do his will. Praise the Lord, all his works, everywhere in his dominion. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. This is the reading of the Lord.
Thanksgiving is a medicine, a medicine for the soul. It's a corrective for the tendency in us to readily seize upon and survey whatever is negative in the world. We're just attracted to that somehow. Listen to the news. What's the news? 90% of it is all the terrible things. And now we know not only the terrible things that, that might be happening close at hand, but we know them all around the world in every little corner. So Thanksgiving, though, is a corrective, a medicine against that. Thanksgiving should be our natural and spontaneous response to God for all the blessings we enjoy every day. Um, because gratitude is one of the most beautiful emotions and attitudes within the range of human expression. An old story has two men sitting down together at a hotel uh, for a meal. Um, one of them immediately began, began to eat without giving thanks. The other one took the time to pause and return thanks for the meal. And then rising his head from his grace, he said to the other one, do you know what someone who sits down to the table and eats food that God gives them without thanking God for it reminds me of? <laughs> you can see where this is going. No, said the other quite abruptly, not really wanting to go in that direction of conversation. Well, said the first, someone who sits down to the table and eats the food that God gives them without even thanking him for it reminds me a good deal of a hog, that's a pig, under a chestnut tree who eats the chestnuts but doesn't even look up to see from where they came. Well, you might wonder at the diplomacy or the wisdom of, of embarking in that conversation with a, his fellow um, at dinner, um, but his remarks do have the ring of truth about them. Thanksgiving to God is surprisingly rare and uncommon, even among us. I do not mean that we don't say thanks, just as we were taught to as children to mind our manners and to say thank you when something was passed to you at the table. Um, and we may very well say grace before meals, fine and good. What is more to the point, however, is whether in the observance of our traditions are we truly thankful. I'm not referring to the routine piety of uh, repeating a rote short prayer, but, but rather to the full-blooded experience of thankfulness which, filling body and soul, overflows in a wonderful release of praise and gratitude to God. This wild strain thanksgiving, strong and exuberant, humble and joyful, that's what we lack and what we need to seek and rekindle on such a day as this. David, the shepherd king and minstrel of Israel, David, the sinner, David, the man after God's own heart, was wise and knowledgeable in these things. And so this morning we're going to follow him along the inspired path that he lays down for us in Psalm 103, which Alfred read for us. And if we look at it and listen to it and heed it, it will lead us from, the, from dullness to light, from the place of apprehension to a place of liberty and joy. It will change our countenance from dark and downcast to uplifting and shining with wise, eyes wide open to the mercies of God. So let us go with this old friend David, the psalmist of old. Let us answer the summons to draw nigh to the holy hill of the Lord and enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise to give him thanks and praise his name. But how and in what manner is this done? David is our guide and model, and we will learn from observation and example. Let's see how he begins. Praise the Lord, O my soul. All my inmost being praise his holy name. It begins with a decision and a, and a command. To worship, to praise, to give thanks is a choice. It's a deliberate turning in a specific direction with a settled purpose. There are many paths we may take and all sorts of directions we can turn. And our lives will be filled up with one thing or another. David and those who choose to follow him make a place and a time to seek the Lord. Now we want to notice that this praise and this worship which David 
uh, settled upon is not a passive thing. It's not something he proposes to do with a partial involvement of himself as, for example, our bodies are in one place while our minds and thoughts and desires and interests are somewhere else. The summons goes out into the entire kingdom that is David's person, his being, his mind, his body, his spirit, all are called to assemble and give voice together to the praise of God's holy name. This kind of worship is a verb. It's active, it's involving. The stirring brass and drums of a military band call forth a patriotism and a falling into line. So also the call to worship is a joyous summons to attend and stand up before the God of creation, to be present before him. And what do we bring him? We bring him thanks. We bring him worship. Having decided upon worship, realizing its claim upon our whole selves, not just an hour on Sunday morning, our whole being, what we are about. Having decided upon worship and realizing its claim upon all of us, how do we begin? Well, praise the Lord, O my soul, David's word repeat. And he leads us on, and forget not all his benefits. The action we are to commence is a recalling, a remembering. So much of what God uh, gives us in Scripture is there to help us remember. Thanksgiving also begins by remembering. But continually and regularly we are prone to forget. We're busy with life. We're doing many things. Many things cross um, our minds. And so we forget the benefits that we receive all the time from his hand. That which is common and steady, that which is sure and familiar, we soon cease to notice, even to comment upon. The good we habitually enjoy, we come to expect and receive thoughtlessly, and even without enjoyment. How many good meals have we gobbled down without even taking the time to taste them and to, to, to savor them? And so blessings uh, enjoyed regularly and usually can become in our unexamined thinking a right that we expect, that something we think is our due and, and not understand as a blessing. In that way, the zest and the flavor and the enjoyment of life are lost. Things that should give us pleasure, oh, just ho hum. A group of visitors at a summer resort had watched the sunset from the balcony of the hotel before dinner. Uh, they were going into dinner once the sun went down. And one man lingered until the very last glow had faded. And he had seemed th thrilled through and through by the whole um, panorama of the sun making its way down and finally setting. And one of the other guests watched him and was more observant than the rest. And it turned out that at supper, this guest was seated uh, beside the man who had been so enthralled by the sunset. And so it was, it was a woman. She said to the man at her side, you certainly did enjoy that sunset, didn't you? Are you an artist? She wondered why it would be, uh, have struck him so strongly, and so she thought maybe he was an artist. He said, no, ma'am, I'm a plumber. <laughs> he said with a slow grin, but I'll tell you what, I was blind for five years. Because the man remembered that he had been blind, because he knew what it was like not to have sight, he had a greater capacity to appreciate the sunset. His wonder and enjoyment of the sunset was richer and deeper because he, un he understood that sight is not a guarantee. And so those who would go with the psalmist into the courts of praise must do so by the pathway of remembering. The review and recall of former blessings are keys into the palace of thanksgiving. Thanksgiving begins with remembering. 
David, our guide for the journey into Thanksgiving, suggests some rooms for us to explore on this um, trip we're taking. Leading the way, he hastens down a darkened hallway. But it is familiar to us somehow. We proceed after him upon a reverie of the mercies of God, who forgives all your sins. There's one. He forgives our sins. I like the way you read that this morning, Alfred, and made it personal. That's, we need to read scripture like that. This is the first room we enter. So quickly stated, but oh, what largeness and stillness abides here. What are the feelings in this happy place? Freedom, liberty, forgiveness, roominess, space, not being cramped and confined. This is the stateroom of prisoners who have been freed from their sins. Their strin- sins have been stripped off their backs. Their records have been cleared, wiped clean. King David knew well enough the stinging rebuke, rebuke of a guilty conscience. He knew and had been there. Here are his words. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. That was his experience once in the past. But now, what relief! The prisoner has been pardoned. In retrospect, the memory of the grand event is played back. He goes on, I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. You wiped it clean. What joy, what blissful release to be forgiven of God, to be free of condemnation, And those who have had such an experience, who stand in the continually bubbling, sparkling, cleansing stream of God's forgiveness, have cause to to rejoice and be glad and give thanks. Our God stands ready to forgive. That's the kind of God he is. And to restore the repentant sinner. Our reflection in this room must stir up sighs of gratitude. Thank you, Lord for your bountiful forgiveness to me. But this is just just the beginning. The psalmist goes on now and leads us to a a room next door and heals all your diseases. Once inside, the mind runs back to forgotten illnesses and sick rooms. There are fevered images of someone lying in weakness upon a bed, This person is excluded from the rush of life. Illness or accident has set them aside. Life goes on outside, outside the window without them. This is their new world, this room, this bed, this disability, this weakness. Pain and suffering of that place is remembered in this room David has led us to. But also the hope that was there, that hope to get well, that maybe one day I will get well the belief and the prayer that you will. And the patient did get well. Health and strength returned to them. They left their bed in their exclusion. They were were granted reprieve and restoration in the dim shadows of this recollection. However, as the recovered patient gazes upon their former state of illness, over in the side of the room in the corner is the figure of the great physician standing there watching He was present throughout all the sickness, hearing every sigh, observant of each sorrow and anxiety, each worried thought. And now as we watch, we see him gently reach up, reach out, and raise up to health again the one who was sick. Rise up, my daughter. Rise up, my son. Be well. Go forth into life again. Those who today enjoy health and strength may have had such an experience. And remember the God who healed them, renewed their strength, gave them clarity of mind, took those burdens on those anxious thoughts away. Thank you, Lord, for your wonderful healing. Once more, the psalmist continues forward, and it seems each subsequent room follows more quickly on the one before it. As the reasons to praise God and give him thanks swell in a rising crescendo, the stirring theme for this latest room is, who redeems your life, 
from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion. Boy, there's a lot there. Redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion. From pit to throne room. Forgiven, and healed, and now redeemed? What words can express the favor and wonder of this new room? The room of forgiveness was large and spacious, but this one expands endlessly on every side. It is bright with beams of light slanting down and bathing the expanse in a glorious, shimmering mystery. Into this room come those whose lives were finished. The way ahead of them was blocked. It was cut short. The future, sooner or late, had meant only an abrupt falling into a deep, unfathomable pit, falling into a hole from which there was no exit, no escape. That was the direction and the destination of their lives, of the course they were on. But there was one who intervened. There was one who barred the path and stood in the gap and laid a wooden cross across the chasm. By his death on Calvary, those deemed by the curse not only of physical death, but what is far worse, of spiritual death, may be redeemed. The Savior came and snatched them from the threat, saved them from eternal loss. Their prospect now is unlimited. No walls block their path into eternal light and life. Death is no longer the dread mystery a black curtain falling on the end of a futile, meaningless play. For they shall walk right through death into unspoken glories beyond. Eternal life is the golden treasure of this room for which the redeemed of Christ can shout, Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God who has broken the hold of death and brings us from night into the glorious light of endless day. And so this day, remember. Remember your salvation in Christ. Recall and review its course in your life. How you were found and redeemed. Wonder once again at the mercy of God to you. At the kindness and grace which lifted you up and set your feet upon the rock. Sing praise to your Redeemer. Thank Him humbly and enthusiastically for your salvation. If all this sounds strange to you, if the the mention of redemption stirs no memory of solace, no blessed assurance, no rising thanksgiving, then there's a fair question to consider. Do you know the salvation to which the psalmist's words here point and which Jesus came to give to all who will come to him and believe? What a blessed thanksgiving this could be for you. What a new and joyful and rich reason you could have for giving thanks today if you will believe on him and take the hand that he's stretching out to you. But he's stretching it out to us all as well. To remember and recall, bring from the past into the present the joy of our salvation, the goodness of God and not leaving us to ourselves. And there's more and more. The marvelous, mysterious prospect of eternity looms ahead, but God's blessings do not wait for then. They rush towards us in the present as God in faithfulness and kindness daily supplies our needs. The song of thanksgiving goes on, verse after verse in Psalm 103, um, as memory warns and quickens to the rising melody. And finally, the vision of the psalmist broadens widely to climax whereupon he calls upon the heavenly hosts and all the Lord's works everywhere in his dominion to praise the Lord. All his works are called to to give voice and sing their part in the song. And so the psalmist returns from whence he began in summoning his own soul to the same happy task. Not just creation in general, but my soul, my heart also must sing the song. He shall take his place among the creation. His voice shall sing its part in the ongoing song. And so must ours. You know, a a conductor, a a skilled conductor, when they're conducting a choir, they notice if a part is missing. 
Maybe the um, general population might not notice. But they know if the bass is missing or the tenor, the alto, the solo is a little off. The, 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 the soprano is a little off there and the key not quite right. A skilled conductor knows that. And so the Lord, if our voice is missing, one single voice, he knows, he misses it. He misses your contribution and mine. Because where is that gratitude? Where is that thankfulness? Where is that joy and gladness? So this Thanksgiving, let's begin again. Not just for today, but say day by day, we're going to be a thankful people, glad people. Glad when we wake up. Even when we're feeling sad, to say, Lord, help me today. Help me to find something good today, something hopeful today, to choose to look at the good and not the, the hurt. So let us be thankful to the Lord for his mercies and take care to remember his loving kindness to us as it is expressed in so many ways. Let us pray. Lord, in, just in the silence of this few moments, bring to our minds those many things, or that one thing, where you have blessed us so deeply. It might be health. It might be our job, it might be family reunion, or our salvation. The wonderful gift of music. A little child comes and hugs you around the knee, unexpectedly, perfect, innocent love. Thank you. Thank you for this congregation, this people. Thank you for this day to remember.